Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Caitlin McGurk. I am one of the curators at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum in Columbus, Ohio, uh, at Ohio State University. It's the largest cartoon library in the world. Uh, I'm really excited to be up here moderating today. Um, on stage with me is Kevin Hazenga, um, best known for his Glenn Ganges series, uh, Anders Nilsson, the author of Big Questions, and John Porcellino, who's been self-publishing King Cat for almost 25 years. So you guys are three of my fam favorite cartoonists, and this is a really great opportunity that I'm excited to have. Um, we've been tossing around ideas for um, panel topics for a little while now for this. And rather than talking about um, maybe how you make your comics and what your comics are all about, being that all three of these authors have kind of an introspective thing going on in their uh, in their artwork, we thought we'd go for more of a why kind of topic. So we're going to start out broad and just first ask... Why, why introspection? <laughs> why introspection? Why are you making comics? And what changed in the time that you started making comics in your original pursuit of that to now? <laughs> well, I think there's, a, there's the boring question of why do comics and then there's the more interesting that's like why why not why not stop or <laughs> why yeah why keep doing comics or what do you get out of it that uh, yeah I mean aside from the money why make yeah, 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 I yeah, thought of an answer <laughs> all right well like for me I was uh Ever since I was a little kid, I was always writing and drawing, and I knew from a young age I wanted to be an artist. And, um, you know, through various convoluted ways, I was introduced to comics as a kid, mostly through, the, like, the Sunday funnies and stuff like that. I wasn't a real comic book reader or whatever. Um, but I knew I wanted to be an artist, and I started studying art and, like, thinking about that kind of thing. and. I, w I was drawing comics because I liked writing and I liked, am I feeding back? Like writing and I like drawing and I like making little books. And um, so like when I went to college, I studied painting. I was a fine arts major. I, I got a degree in painting. But I had a lot of uh, issues with the way that the fine art world works that I won't necessarily have to go into here. But uh, at some point I realized that making comics, uh, like comics as a medium, I could express myself and without having to deal with a lot of these issues. Like I was really, I mean the things I liked about comics were that they were uh, reproducible and they were uh, affordable and that um, they were accessible to most people, you know. I mean, nowadays there's a lot of comics that are very difficult to follow, you know. They're kind of complicated forms that people use. But, you know, essentially if you hand somebody a comic, they know what to do with it in our, in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I was really interested in, in using comics as a way to reach people who would not necessarily... Um, be, they have access to uh, fine art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's why comics for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I can relate to that in terms of just the sort of presumed accessibility. I feel like, you know, some of what I do maybe isn't uh, quite as accessible as like the Sunday funnies or whatever, sure. but it is. Come, I also came out of an art school background or art school education. And once school was over, it felt like comics was something that um, I could give to my coworkers, or I could give to my, you know, family, my uncle, and he would be able to sort of like penetrate it. Yeah, but and even if the you are your your comics are very, you know, I don't know what the word you use, but it, you know, like complicated. <laughs> The form itself of comics right. is accessible, and and it's like even within something like big questions, it's like there are there's these kind of like you know grand themes or whatever, but it's they're t it's told through like little cartoon birds that talk. So 
um, yeah, that kind of sort of low culture uh, thing that comics has of, of being in the newspaper or being superhero comics. I mean, that was one thing also as a kid. Um, I always... I always read comics. My my family would, you know, we would go to museums, and and my mom was very interested in. She was a librarian, and she would always be bringing back all kinds of different books and zines and culture. I mean, I probably saw Raw first because my mom brought it home. Um, and I loved going to the museum and like seeing Rembrandt or whatever was happening. But the X Men comics that I had that I like traded with my friends were the thing that. Like I could reread and I could own this actual like art object, you know. It's like it could be mine in a much more sort of uh, basic, down to earth way. I don't, I, I don't understand you guys' answers because like <laughs> I don't think about that stuff at all. Like, well, I don't think about it anymore. <laughs> I'm, think, I'm saying I made the choice. Like when I graduated. From but college like, in 1990, and I was doing King, started King Cat in '89, and I was just like, I don't. I'd rather just draw comics than make paintings and try to find somebody to hang them up and go through that whole. Mm -hmm. But would you draw comics if, if, if every if there was nobody to read them, you wouldn't draw comics then? Is what you're, is that what you, you mean? Well, that's funny because that was like a. a classic art school argument that I would have with my friends was like, uh -huh. if you woke up tomorrow and you were the only person left on earth, would you still make art? And of course, as a young whippersnapper, idealistic, I'd be like, of course I would make art. Like, I'm a born artist. I have to do this. It's in my blood or whatever. And then uh -huh. as I got older, I thought that's bullshit. I wouldn't do it. Why would I do it? There's nobody to look at it. What's the point of doing it? But actually now I do feel like I would. I feel like it's just a, in, it's an ingrained way for me to engage the world. And if I'm the only person left, I'm still going to engage it in an artistic way and probably make art of some kind. I probably wouldn't draw comics necessarily. But... Um, yeah, I think having an audience is super important and that's one of the reasons that comics felt like they worked for me. But part of what I, why I do it is to entertain myself too. Like, sure. I feel like if I'm drawing something and it makes me laugh, then I have a good idea that somebody else will get something out of it. What about it? So you would... Well, for me, it's like I never... live on a desert island and draw <laughs> comics and give them to the fish? Well, no, for me, I mean, like, uh, I never considered doing anything else, and so, like, the, you know, the, like, the idea of doing any kind of art is the same as doing comics, because, like, it, I, I wouldn't... There never was a question of me like am I gonna you know write fiction or do paintings or exhibit in galleries or anything like that like that I there was never like a choice like I'm gonna you know of all the possibilities this is the one that I choose and this is why so for me it's hard to hmm. well I was drawing comics the whole time of well, yeah, I was yeah. a kid and it was like I was drawing comics and playing in a band and making paintings and yeah writing poetry or doing whatever and it and you know I just got to a point where I was like I can like I can do this stuff that I'm doing in painting in comics form and that feels more right to me so I don't have to do this other thing but yeah I mean I was always drawing comics from the time I was a little kid so it's not like I heard about this thing called comics and it sounded like a good idea to make yeah. art well so why form. like but why comics and nothing else, like. Yeah. Well, it's just because I just happened to read. Um, I got some comics from the drugstore, and then that's the first thing that I ever started drawing was copying those, and so. You know, that's just how it happened. You know, I was like already twelve or whatever at that point, and so. I just started doing that, and then it was just like, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm this. This is good. I'm good with this. Yeah. But um, what I wanted to to ask, I guess, was that, like, so why do, I'm just curious, is, like, why do anything, uh, like, artistic, like, what is it that get, you get out of it? Like, is it a, 
Is it like, is it a way to be less lonely? Is it a, is it something that like, you can't, you know, the ideas just come and they have to, you know, go somewhere? Or is it like, is the actual act of making something like such a, you know, strong, set, you know, feeling of ecstasy and euphoria it's sometimes when you're working? Yeah. No, I'm just, just, just kind of wondering what, you know. Well, I do think, and one thing that I realized, like, later on was that uh, I do think, for me, a big part of it is just communicating with people and, like, connecting with people because I, I w you know, I was just... I always had a hard time in, like, face-to-face -face situations. I was just, like, a nervous kid, you know? And I wanted to express myself, but, um, you know, I guess making comics or, like, these books and stuff, it was, like, it wasn't like... I could tell a story to somebody, but I could write it down and give it to them, and it, it didn't have this, like, same peril of, like... It was kind of removed. I could sit and I could think about things and formulate a way of saying something and put it down. I mean, I wasn't thinking about this when I was a kid. It's just looking back. And so I, I think for me, a large part of it is just it's a way for me to engage with other people and, and to communicate things not only one way, but to, yeah, like engage. And but when you, were, when you were a kid and you were doing it, would you like, do you remember feeling like a, just like a peaceful feeling of... And, you know, just working and I don't know. You know, like that kind of thing. I feel like for me, it's like um, having stories read to me as a kid, or like engaging with you know, with the comics that I was reading or the books that I was reading was so enjoyable. I guess it was just like like entering these other worlds and sort of imagining the possibilities of. stories was so compelling and then I mean I didn't do a, like I drew a ton but I didn't really do comics much as a kid but but drawing was like that it's like you you drew you draw characters or you draw a landscape or like when I was a little kid my friend and I would like put all these pieces of paper on his wall and draw these huge battle scenes you know with like underwater and you and like read com you read stuff. comics and read science fiction or something or yeah, just sort yeah. of, you know, the yeah, fantasy novels and stuff. Um, and it is, like, do, so, so making comics or making drawings for myself is very much, like, I can participate. I can, like, create my own worlds. And it's, like, you can make them the way you want them. You know, you don't have to sort of, like, accept somebody else's version or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But the, it's, there's also, when I think about, like, why did I decide to make, art it's like I, I'm interested it's like I think I grew up with um, parents that were very political my my biological parents are both uh, um, kind of counterculture hippie types um, very political my dad's an artist so it was like the idea of kind of like grappling with like what is the world about and like what do things mean and why are things a certain way was always really interesting and compelling to me and like those are the kinds of stories that really interested yeah. me. I actually have just been going back and reading some old comics um, like some old X-Men comics and like in some ways they're almost unreadable like they're just like it's like these crazy soap operas and then like aliens are invading and everybody's fighting and somebody gets kidnapped and somebody's mind is being controlled or whatever. Like there's so much happening at once it sort of like just is impossible to read. But some of those old like Chris Claremont X-Men stories are kind of dealing with these like human rights issues and like, like global politics and stuff in a kind of an interesting way. Um, which is probably why, you know, one reason they became really popular. But, but that, yeah, I love that stuff. So answer your own question, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel well, about Kevin? Well, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. Well, just about, I, I don't remember what the question was, but, I, you know, like, I, I didn't grow up with uh, any examples of, uh, of an art, 
artists in my family, or yeah, I didn't either. know any was, artists either. It was not and cool to be an artist in my family. Yeah, I still don't even really, you know, it's hard to think that <laughs> I am an artist. Yeah. Like, because I, I, you know, yeah, didn't have any examples of that, what, the, what it was like to be like that, or to like live in your imagination all the time, or always have a project going that was like very serious and important, but was just, you know, completely impractical or ridiculous from another perspective. So uh, it's it still feels weird. Well, and that's, I feel like that's something that I've made work about too a little bit is like, like on one level it is really compelling and I am really interested in dealing with, you know, sort of big issues or whatever, but I'm also very aware and have been since I was in art school that being an artist is kind of self-indulgent and a little bit pointless. <laughs> it's like there are yeah. there are like real problems in the world that people are trying to grapple with on a practical level and it's kind of like, well, I just sit in my studio and draw pictures of birds, so it's cool. Yeah, but I th- uh, yeah, I, th- I mean, of course, everybody, you think about that, but I think, I mean, I do believe that, like, it's an important role to play. I think that it serves an important role in our society, or in any society, and I, I mean, I kind of just had to learn to come to terms with the fact that this is what my life is, you know. Um, but yeah, it was, took a long, long time for me to, and I, I still, you know, deal with it sometimes, but you know, I, I think that everybody has a different position to play, and I, for some reason, I ended up with this position of making right. art, making comics, mm-hmm. you know, more specifically, and so be it. Have any of you ever stopped? Can you talk about I've why? tried. <laughs> and why you started again? I stopped because comics make me crazy. Let's hear about it. But I have started again because as crazy as they make me, I'm crazier when I don't do comics. Okay. Was it the isolation of working on them all the time? Or? Um, for me in particular, I went through a long period where I suffered really badly from obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, with OCD, it's like whatever you're focusing on, the OCD is focusing on. And so, like, to try to make my comics was just, like, it was like, I know it seems silly to say unless you've experienced this kind of thing, but it's just like gut wrenching. Yeah. It, it was just, it was just awful in every way. Um, for me, uh, my biochemistry to allow me to create stuff. Um, and that's mostly why I would have tried to quit. You know, I, I mean, I would, you know, I'd have those ideas like I, I just want to like get a regular job, and then I'll like, you know, find someone nice and we'll have a house and some kids, and, yeah. and I'll bring home the bacon. <laughs> I love bacon. <laughs> I don't. I've never tried to stop. No. Yeah. No. Never in fact. Stop. If anything, I've tried to arrange everything else in my life so that that could keep going and that I could have a little, and you know, for better or for worse, a lot for worse, but, uh, you know, arrange my life so that I can have this, like, and I'm very, like, fiercely protective of it, like, my time to work and, like, I mean, it's abs- I totally know it's absurd and selfish. Well, and at the same so time, it's like, that's, you know, it's always like, there's going to, that's, there's always going to be that. I mean, one, I should say, like, I have tried to quit a few times. I mean, I don't know how long it will, would last, a month or a couple months or something, you know. But, like, one thing that I tried to learn in my life was, like, how to sustain it, you know. And so I would look at other artists, whether they were cartoonists or musicians or painters or whatever, and, like, try to figure out, like, how did these people live this life? live the life that they had in a way that like allowed them to keep going because it's it's oftentimes hard like I'd be really interested like in like people like Bob Dylan who like by his own admission like went through long stretches where he just was not inspired at all you know and like yet he managed to work his way through those periods and you know create 
stuff of value still and then move on to places where like you know he opened up whole new worlds in his in his own art for him to explore and if he had given up he would have never reached those points and so I knew like I said I've known ever since I was a kid I wanted to be an artist mm -hmm. and so a lot of my process has been figuring out how do I do that and how do I keep going as an artist because there's nothing else I can do, you know? So, like, I have to figure this out, you know? Yeah, I feel like, I feel like part of, I mean, not that I've ever necessarily wanted to quit, although, you know, there, I guess there are sort of slow patches or, like, it's like, you know, years when you're just not making much money or whatever, it's like, it just seems kind of ridiculous that you're, you're sort of plugging away. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that on a, on a, in a sort of good way and bad way, that thing of like not really having an alternative, it's like I, because I've arranged my life where I have not learned how to do anything else, yeah. it's like, well, I guess this is... Once guessing. you've done that, does it make it easy to stay inspired to, with more stories? Or are you, like, is it... Once I you're have, rolling, you keep having stuff coming to you? I have so many stories. Like, if I just started drawing, like, 12 hours a day tomorrow, I could probably draw for, like, five years and not run out of stories. It's yeah. just, like, having the gumption or the drive to actually to, to do it sometimes. And, I, you know, I mean, I'm not – I'm just, like, a guy who's had a lot of anxiety and depression and stuff. And so, like, those things have caused – you know – those are the things that are the pressures, you know, on me. Yeah, besides money and stuff, but I never really cared about the money so much, you know. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know. But um, I was going to say something real smart. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what were you saying? What did you say? Give me a quick recap of what you said. Because <laughs> there was something in response to that you had said. About sort of just not having an alternative. I'd like yeah. It's not like particularly I, I feel like that's like a secret to being a successful Here artist comes. is not giving yourself a backup plan. Actually. Yeah, I mean that w actually that was a huge turning point for me, and it's only been a short while. But like when I turned forty, it wasn't so much like a midlife crisis because I'm not really concerned about that. But it was more like, um, okay, I'm forty years old, like there's nothing else I can do. Mm -hmm. Like I'm. And not even that I couldn't do it, because I could. I could probably get, uh, become an accountant. I could, like, you know, intellectually do that. But, like, I'm just not going to. It's not in the cards for me. Like, somehow my, whole, my life has led up to this point where I'm 40 years old, I'm a cartoonist, and that's basically it. I'm not going to become a lawyer. I'm not even going to become the manager at a McDonald's. I'm going to, I'm a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. And so... I have to learn to come to terms with that. I learn, have to learn to stop fighting myself all the time. And, uh, you know, it's a lot better when you're not fighting yourself all the time. But, yeah, it, it, it was a relief to just admit to myself, like, this is what I do. And this is how I do it. And that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be something else. Yeah. Kevin, do you feel anything? Well, no, I mean, John and I have talked about this in the past, but I think we both share this kind of thing about, like, yeah, being an artist or a cartoonist especially, you know, is like, it doesn't feel natural, yet you're like, well, that's what I want to do. And so it's kind of this, you go, you know, you, you always feel like you're playing some role or you're, and, I, and, and, you know, finding a way to accept that is... Do you think that's partly because it, it wasn't, yeah, we, growing up in a family like a where it's like... Oh, yeah, for me, good. absolutely, it was like psychological baggage for me. Mm -hmm. Because when I draw comics, I feel like I, I, I do get excited. I do, I'm like, this is what I was born to do. I, had, I well, feel I like there was no doubt in my mind, this is what I was put right. on the planet to do, is draw these comics. And I will tell myself, like, don't forget, like, this is it, you know, how you feel. And, like, for me, and especially during the OCD years... I would put that, like, literally, I would put down the pencil, and it would be like, I never had that, but, like, I couldn't even conceive of having that feeling of, like, home, like, I'm home, 
I, like, when I'm drawing comics, I'm in my place in the universe. And so, like, to pick up, it, it would go, like, to pick up the pencil was this ordeal. And uh, that's what I mean. Like, that's what I had to come to terms with. That's what I had to learn to accept and, and learn how to work through that thing where, like, it's like, okay, right now, you you know, doing comics seems like the worst thing you can do in the world, but that's what you're supposed to do. So just pick up the pencil and start. And then that feeling will come back. But yeah, I mean, for me, I don't know how applicable this would be to anybody else. I think it's just my own, like, morbid biochemistry. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, that's what I kind of wanted to ask you guys about was that, like, I mean, for me, it's that when things are going right and you're ideas are coming and you have a, a sense of where things are going and you're working on stuff and there's just like that sense of you know flow with the work and everything going like I think that's the reason why I keep doing it is just because for that feeling when it's going good and then and it does feel like oh like this is what I should be doing everything's working you know I'm like my I'm, I'm working at my full potential like They're efficient you know well, but also, like, mentally, like, you know, I'm, like, putting a lot of myself into this, and I think other people, you know, a decent amount of other people will, you a know, it's a, it's, a weird, and it's a weird, <laughs> and it's a weird way of feeling connected to the work that you're doing, and to yourself, and to the audience, all the same, even though you're, like, alone, and you're, right. you know, you have the radio on, maybe, you know, the music on, and you're working, but you're, like, that's just kind of, like, a good feeling and like you know that's the that's the the thing I keep coming back to I think is searching you know getting trying to get to that point and staying there yeah trying to ride the wave <laughs> yeah <laughs> such a high yeah. <laughs> have any of those feelings changed between the times where you were just self publishing and then you know getting book deals and working in the industry I don't really, I don't feel a big difference. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the sort of self-publishing versus having a publisher is just kind of like the mechanics of how the books get into the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think at, at time, I guess when I first was sort of confronting the possibility of having a publisher when I was working on um, my first story for uh, Drawn and Quarterly, it was a big deal problem in my brain. Like I had a really, really hard time. Um, because up to that point, it's like it was just me like drawing in my sketchbook and then photocopying it for my yeah, friends. And it's control. almost this feeling of like this, it's kind of like nobody's really gonna see it. It doesn't really matter. Like I can do whatever I want, you know? And so that it's, which is liberating. Yeah. And then as soon as, you know, Drawn and Quarterly was like, hey, you wanna do a story for us? It was like, okay. This has to be the best thing I've ever made in my life. Yeah, and it's in someone's hands partially too. Like you don't, you lose a bit of control over it. It seems. Yeah. Although that, to me, that at that point, that wasn't that wasn't an issue. It was more like, like I have to live up yeah, to this. Like a, and yeah. and at simultaneously, I knew like you can't go into the creative process with that. Right. Mind. Right. Like yeah. that's gonna yeah, totally you're aware fuck that you're, yeah. you're shooting yourself. In yeah. Foot. And it did like. That, that making that book was like the biggest ordeal of any you know work that I've done probably. Huh. Has, has that changed? No, the um, dogs in water. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel kind of lucky. Like the same thing where like by the time I started, the world became such that I would be able to work with outside publishers. I feel like I had pretty much I had developed a way of doing what I wanted to do that I felt pretty secure in, mm -hmm. you know? So like that hasn't changed too much. Although there is there is like a certain amount of weird pressure like Anders was saying of like, oh, all these other people are gonna see it. Or like, you know, for me, and this was a big part of like, you know, I think coming from punk rock, punk rockers often talk about this kind of thing, but like, you know, um, Um, let me think about that for 
a second. Um, like it's sort of selling out kind of question? No, not, like not really selling out, but... Ah, fuck it, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll, you guys talk and I'll, th I'll think, see if I can regain my train of thought. I haven't much to add other than that. I feel a lot the same way that Anders does that... Uh, having started out doing it just on my own and then and never thinking that like I was going to be a guy who like had a publisher and had to s sit in front of people and talk into a microphone <laughs> and yeah. all that kind of stuff and feeling like totally happy and at peace with doing it that way and it's it, you know it's been more difficult to try to and I I definitely have it with like when trying to you know some cartoonists are able to also be illustrators and designers and work with all these clients and so forth and I I tried to do that for a while and have kind of come to accept that I just can't I just have a hard time doing that because my just you know my pr creative brain doesn't work that way but yeah like yeah. as soon as someone else is involved in yeah, the process I'm not good at it's like that other all these psycho dramas take place completely on my end mm -hmm. where it's like you know they're going to hate it and I I'm already mad at them for, <laughs> for, for being disappointed in, in what <laughs> I know they're going to be disappointed in, and so then I'll sabotage it, you know, et cetera. Yeah. What I was struggling to remember to say earlier was, like, like coming out of punk rock and the zine world and, and stuff like that where, you know, here's my black and white photocopied art object that I sell for, you know, a buck or two bucks or three bucks. Um, a lot of my mental struggles with starting to work with the publisher had to do with like, okay, now there's going to be this like $30 hardcover book mm -hmm. of these things and like, what does that mean and like, do I want that? Because I mean like, you know, in a lot of ways, I was, ma I was making zines because that was the art form I felt comfortable with for those reasons I mentioned earlier. It was affordable and it was accessible and you know I could do it all myself and things like that and suddenly I was also working in this other world where like it, it was less affordable and I was working with these other people and they might have had ideas about this or that and it, not that I mean like D&Q has never like told me you can't do this, you can't do that they just don't do that but it's, it's more my own ideas about what this process was going to be like. Mm -hmm. And that took a little bit of juggling mm -hmm. mentally to wrap my head around. Like, I'm happy. Like, when I think about, like, the King Cat Classics book, it was like a $30 book. Are you kidding? $30. They're, like, so much money. <laughs> and, you know, but it's, like, 384 pages. Like, a King Cat is $32, 32 pages for $3. So it's rough. It's, like, over 10, you know, I, I did the math where, like, <laughs> per page, it's a better deal than buying a king cat. So, so it's okay. So it's okay. Uh, you know, so it's okay. Uh, I can't. I shouldn't feel too bad about. It, but I like did all that stuff. Yeah. But like creatively, I feel by the time I started working in that those formats, like I I had enough self confidence as an artist to like know what I want to do, and also like the self awareness, like Anders was saying it of like recognizing when I'm stepping into it, setting a trap for myself or, mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, not that I still didn't get caught in them, but I knew, okay, I'm, I'm getting caught in my own trap here. Yeah, it was, I mean, you sort of asked, like, does that still happen? And I feel like for some reason after that experience, it was just like, maybe I just had to go through it once or something, but it was yeah. just like, just burns now a I whole, just it just burns a hole through your soul that is never patched back up. So it's just, yeah. you know, you're you're, you're <laughs> well, just, no, it's like damaged, now it's you're like damaged I don't care. Like, like, <laughs> like, like you're I less even, aware of it now, like while you're in the process that you're making. I don't think about it publisher. at all. Like I don't. Even, it's like like putting big questions together. For example, I mean, yeah. I, you know, like I wanted it to be the you know the best book it could be and stuff, but it was just like that kind of like feeling like I had to make sure that you know my publisher was going to like it or whatever it was just like mm -hmm. uh, it, like mm -hmm. if I am doing the best job that I can do for myself like then that's what that's what it's about mm -hmm. yeah. um, can you guys talk a little bit your uh, inspirations outside of comics and how they've fed any of your work 
Uh, I mean, Sontag. my answer to that, like, uh, I think it was Susan Sontag said, like, she said, like, a writer is interested in every, is a, a writer is a person who's interested in everything. And that's how I feel. I'm, like, interested in everything. Yeah. I mean, I, there's nothing that I encounter that in some way isn't being applied to King Cat yeah. for me. You know, I mean. Yeah, but there's the major things. There's, like, punk rock, <laughs> there's Buddhism. Sure. The mid, mm -hmm. You know, there's. Uh, Your cat. Cat. Your cat. Yeah. But also sort of like a, you know, like an autobiographical <laughs> slant on writing rather than like you don't you don't write fiction or no. you know so there's like a certain you know sure yeah yeah I mean like I'm really influenced like I'm particularly influenced I think by music uh, and um, what kind any kind I don't know it depends like sometimes I'm like I went through a period where I was like super influenced by the Beach Boys like all oh. my comics were like Beach Boys songs I remember that you know <laughs> that's good that too right? over and over yeah, yeah. I mean, just it's not like it's it's more like the approaching comics as is it the form of the music or is it the it's like yeah it's like everything it's like the the way you title it and the mood you're trying to create through music and kind of the uh, poetry of the lyrics maybe a little bit like you know what you leave in and what you leave out. I feel like also the structure of songs or like rhythm is very similar to the way pl plot is structured or like events are structured it's like plot sort of traditionally you know starts out sort of just establishing uh, the basic constituents of the world that you're create you're talking about and then you know developing characters and sort of is building an in intensity the same way a song might kind of like build up to a climax I mean, I, I think like I think about individual issues of King Cat are very much like albums of music to me, where mm -hmm. like you've got this body of work that you create over a period of time that you know maybe has hopefully it probably has some coherence, if nothing else, than like there it was created during a particular point in your life. Maybe you're thinking about certain things during that point in your life, but you know also j then just like sequencing these things like I okay I've got these songs and I want to make this album collection of them mm -hmm. how do I do that in the most effective way where like you know this idea or the rhythms of this comic it's there's so many different you know all these different things to consider how is that going to flow into the next one and you know like you know like a lot of times in King Cat's the, I, I'll have a letters column or like a top 40 list of things or just like weird, some little junk like that and they'll like be in the middle of the book and it's, it's like there's like a side one and a side two as well and I'll, I'll use those those little bridge sections I mean they really are like a bridge between oftentimes like like you know what I'm trying to say in that issue there's like a a little bit of a arc there where those there, there's a little bit of a, a narrative between the first part and the second part mm -hmm. that it, when you read them in order and that you know that that section bridges it and gives it a little bit of a gap it's like flipping the record over mm -hmm. I guess I'll just think about how like you probably don't want your comics probably aren't everyone's entire lives, right, that do this, because you need to have other things that are feeding into it all of the time. And I also wonder, in that realm, like, how much communities can, are beneficial, but also if they're ever, like, stifling to creativity at all? Was the outside I don't influence? think I've ever if been in a really situation in that I had enough community around that it was stifling necessarily. Yeah. I, I mean, I used to think, like, like, I, I you know this is great. I can go anywhere and do what I do. I don't need anything around. You know, like I, it's just, I can go. You know, when I remember when I moved to Denver in the early '90s, I didn't know anybody there. You know, it was just like I'm just gonna go here because it's cheap, and like I don't need it. as long as there's like a photocopier and a and a post office, I'm set. You know, but you know, obviously there's benefits to community and. Uh, the older I've gotten, the more I've really realized, you know, 
I, I may have a community that's kind of long distance mm -hmm. or people that I only see a couple times a year, or once a year, once every five years. Right. But that's my community and it's really important to me. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about in terms of uh, influences outside of comics, I was just thinking that <coughs> there's actually only one person that I sent a copy of Big Questions to that is not comics, a person that I, you know, have never met or anything. Um, Jack Cousteau. And it's like, it's almost like slightly <laughs> embarrassing to admit this, but uh, his name's Bart Ehrman and he's a biblical scholar. And I just had read a bunch of his books and sort of like listened to um, lectures, uh, lectures that he's given and stuff. And what's interesting, I mean, he's a really interesting guy in that he started out as a sort of super fundamentalist Christian. He came here actually to go to the Moody Bible Institute and he was really interested in like studying the Bible because he wanted to know what God was actually really trying to say like in the original languages and stuff. And then slowly he ended up kind of losing his faith because he realized like what a sort of human document the Bible is. Mm -hmm. um, but he has a lot of really interesting things to say about meaning and about the fact that people want to find what is like, what does the Bible really mean? Like people want really badly to have an anchor of meaning in their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, it's interesting because it's like he sort of slowly uh, over this sort of kind of grueling process like lost that, but he sort of ended up coming around to a different way of looking at it where it's like you are going to be making the meaning yourself. And so it's like, it's not really about what the Bible means, it's about like what does it mean to you or whatever, I don't know. So anyway, um, there's a lot of stuff like that or you know other kind of um, philosophy or whatever that sort of fed into what big questions is about um, but he was one guy who was like he probably is never doesn't read comics like did you respond who no, no I haven't I haven't heard back from him and I don't, you know whatever I don't care but like yeah um, huh. yeah but it was like he was sort of the one guy who was like I wonder, he did, he actually you know? influenced what I did. Sure. Like this book would be a very different book without this person. Yeah. And there's probably one or two other people like that. But well, It's interesting to think about how, how often you think about an audience outside of cartoonists and comics fans reading your material and how they're going to yeah. take it. Yeah, which is an interesting Like, Are you ever writing thing. for people who don't just all, you know, the small bubble of people that well, read comics? Well, that was actually, actually another thing my um, I come from like my grandfather was a Lutheran minister and my uncle just retired but he was a Lutheran minister Gosh. and he he's really interested in my work you know has no comics background he lives in a tiny little town in northern Minnesota and like you know is a pastor but he's really interested in that stuff and sort of wants to like you know he'll tell me like I really I don't think I really get it but like like it's really interesting and um, and that means a lot to me because like I said I mean he and my grandfather were ministers and like I I'm totally not religious at all but I feel a real connection to what they do it's like they get they would get up every you know once a week and get in front of a bunch of people and try to explain what the world is about to these people and like you know what's important and what's not important and how you should treat people, and it's like, you know, that's, to a great extent, that's what my work's about, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think of that as part of my audience, for sure. I don't know, I'm listening to these guys' good answers, I'm, my mind <laughs> is going, is going blank. Uh, yeah, like, you know, like John, I, I get a lot of ideas from musical forms and or what, what Anders said. Um, I think I think in terms of that a lot of times uh, when I'm starting on a story, knowing it wants, you know, it's going to go fast or it's going to go slow or if it's going to, you know. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't really know. <laughs> okay. Do you think of an audience outside of comics fans when you draw? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would, you know, fa you know, I fantasize about it, but I'm realistic in, in that I think that I, you know. Um, well, you're a huge reader. I mean, like, so what? You and your wife compete with how many books that you finish every month, right? Wow. Well, not really, but that's the idea of the blog. Where's John going? I don't know. <laughs> He's sick of your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're done. No, so what have you been reading? Like, influences outside of comics, what have you been reading? Um, well, you know, I... Lately, I've been thinking, you know, like, uh, I've been reading this book called Designing Universal Knowledge, and it's all about, it's, it's all about, well, it's about a lot of things, but it's about, I've been thinking about, like, the early days of computer uh, science when, like, they were just starting to make computers, and they had, these, these, these guys in the early days, these visionaries, had all these ideas about w the way that the information would would be presented and interacted with with computers. And they had all these different ideas about how that could happen. Um, but then, you know, pretty soon those forms got locked down so that, you know, you had a mouse and a desktop. Is that like Alan Turing? Or is it after him? Uh, or before him? I guess that would be part of it, too. Yeah. But, you know, just the idea that, like, how would the data be... I mean, it sounds... It's, I'm boring myself by <laughs> saying this. But, um, you know, I've been thinking about a lot of that kind of stuff, and, and it, the only place that shows up in my comics, I guess, is that in Ganges 4, there's this part where Glenn is laying in bed, and there's a calendar. He's thinking about things that are going to happen in the future or in the past or whatever, and there's kind of this calendar display above him and he's kind of like scrolling through it and moving around and then he thinks about zooming into a box and like that all those memories would be already recorded in that box you know and that kind of stuff um, that's all I got sorry um, <laughs> so when when we were originally proposing this panel we mentioned that you know all of you happen to be from the Midwest, and I was wondering if anyone has an opinion about how being Midwestern has affected your comics. I think I used to sort of feel like, like, because, I mean, that is a question that sort of pops up every once in a while, and especially early on, I was pretty well, like, very much associated with Paul Hornschmeyer and Jeff Brown, The Holy Consumption, Chicago, people would be like, you know, what is it about Chicago? Like, there's all these cartoonists in Chicago. And, and I sort of felt like, well, like, really, do we have anything? Like, is my work really like Chris Ware's work? Or is it, you know, eh? Um, but last fall, I, I, uh, I think I just finished Big Questions, and I was driving around kind of doing book tour stuff. And... Um, at the beginning of that, I started in L.A. and sort of moved up the coast and was driving through the Pacific Northwest, and I was just, like, realizing how much the landscape is... It's just, like, it's not like anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's totally a Minnesota, like, North Dakota landscape that I draw um, over and over and over and over. Which, to me, it's like when I, was, when I do that, I'm sort of thinking, like, this is sort of, like, the basic archetypal landscape of, you know the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. And then driving through like the rainforests of you know, Washington and Oregon, it was like, oh no, it's totally not at all. Like, it's very particular. Yeah. Um, theme thematically, I don't know. I, I think you could probably make a pretty good case, but maybe you could poke holes in that case too. I don't know. Yeah. Kevin? Well, I mean, I don't know what the Midwest, what is, what is the, what is the Midwest? What is the Midwest? <laughs> it's pretty big. John, you want to tell us what the Midwest is? 
I mean, I, you know, like I, I think about answering the question and then I start to think about it and I was like, I don't even really know what that even means in the mid Midwest yeah. because it's associated with, of course, like, you know, certain things and I, I guess, I don't know, you know. But I would say like Glenn lives. Yeah, in Glenn kind of lives like in the suburban Midwestern. I think of it as being kind of the Michiana uh, <laughs> area. Uh, but, I, you know, I've never lived anywhere else, so I don't, I don't know. I don't have anything to compare it to. I've never lived in a big city, and I've never, uh, you know, lived in a fishing community. Or, You know, it does bother me sometimes when people say that Glenn is an everyman and that it's everyday life or something because I'm like you know he's a white suburban guy who you know it's not necessarily every day or every man but I mean I guess do, what do people on the coasts do comics, comics about? about you know coasty things <laughs> city life they do wild comics out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> you seen some of that stuff? LSD. Yeah, and you could, yeah. No, I do think that so there's... So I'm saying I reject the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know. Like, it's, I, I do think there's something to it, but then, like Kevin said, when you really start to think about it, it sounds like silly. But, I mean, I think that there is, like, a, I mean, the Midwestern landscape is really important to me too and it is really particular you know this is it's this part of the country that, and I, uh, I think there's a certain plainness to it you know that I mean I remember actually driving with Kevin in Indiana we were probably driving to Columbus or something I was just like look at how beautiful it is <laughs> <laughs> and like a lot of people you know if you were raised in Seattle or something or San Francisco you may not you'd be like what why is this right, beautiful think it's, it's a wasteland it's boring yeah. there's nothing North Dakota's here. like that I think people think it's just like there's nothing here and to me it's just like ma totally magic yeah, yeah it's, it's just and that, and partially that I mean you draw that on your covers a lot but how does that affect your work I mean well, other than just the feel of it the yeah I just think I mean I'm, I'm interested I'm interested in finding something and really plain you know, I'm interested in finding, being curious about things that, that on the surface seem uninteresting. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's a Midwestern thing. <laughs> that's what it is. Somebody write it down. <laughs> well, there's this idea that, like, in the Midwest, you're, like, not supposed, if you, if you seem, if you act, like, Oh, out of the ordinary, yeah. it's kind of like, who does he think he is? Oh, Mr. You know, Big like, Shot, huh? Oh, you're an individual, huh? I don't you know, know. <laughs> uh, I guess you know. I can see how that kind of, I kind of have that feeling too. Like, I don't want to do anything that's too flashy or special. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to like, you know, a lot of times I I want to try to have it be readable and straightforward. I don't, I'm not trying to like. Yeah, know. I mean, for me, that's definitely. I, I mean, I appreciate other cartoonists, what they do and their formal inventions and things like that. I'm just, as a, for me as a cartoonist, I'm just not interested in that. Yeah, you know, I'm interested in like tweaking this traditional narrative here and there, and I'm interested in seeing what I can do with it. But, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in telling stories in comics form and and like I, I love panels, you know. I like, you know, I just I like I like a lot of the traditions of comics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I like using that traditional form to do something different. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, like you know. I, I think it is true. I mean, you travel around the country, you meet different people, but, and you know, I think Midwesterners for the most part are pretty plain spoken and kind of down to earth, and and that those are things that. I would hope different, like than all those like disgusting Portland cartoonists. No, I'm not saying they're disgusting. But <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just making a joke. Yeah, if you go, I mean, if you go to the Portland East Coast, it's like a very different feeling. Yeah, there's more sort of like. I mean, I think probably 
there, it's a more competitive in say sure. Brooklyn or something too. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have to kind of try to make your mark a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, stand and out. And part of what you know, so there's going to be a little more sort of exuberance and like kind of craziness or whatever maybe. I think we're running. Yeah. Out so time. in other words, no, it's right. just getting started here. <laughs> well, let's open it up to, to questions. Does anyone have any? Yes. Uh, I did have something. Uh, you, guys, you guys were talking earlier about like the importance of what you're doing, and like there might be some people who are doing important work that help people or you know, feed people or whatever. But uh, <laughs> but just just to let you know that like when I'm riding the bus to work to a job that I hate, you know what I mean? Like reading that comic on that bus ride elevates me to a certain. You know, like you are helping me in that moment. You know? So just thank you. And it's not even just entertainment, it's almost like you're you're adding something into my life that no one else would do, you know. Like it's it's a unique experience for that moment mm -hmm. almost and it's almost I wouldn't want to say sacred, but it's to that level. You know what I mean? Like it's not because because it's uh because it's more artful and you're adding something into it, it elevates. So thanks for that. Yeah. Keep making Thanks for saying that. Yeah, that yeah. that means something. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? My question was, is there an element of escapism in being an artist? There's no me. escape. <laughs> yeah. There's no escape. I definitely, like, I think escapism is a sort of complicated word because there, for me, definitely there is an escapism because it is, like, it is totally pleasurable for me to invent a world where you know, I can kind of make myself laugh and, you know, come up with funny scenarios or whatever. On the other hand, I really do try to grapple with real stuff, you know, like I kind of, I want my readers to be entertained and sort of transported, but I also kind of want to like hook them a little bit, like needle them and sort of be like, but have you paid attention to this thing? Like. <laughs> Um, so I, I try to do both. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if in mine, I don't, I haven't thought this out before I said it, so I don't know how accurate it is, but it's like, I'm, I'm hoping with my comics to get people to engage more directly with their own lives, you know? So I don't want to, is that like anti-escapism? Not, not that like it's not fun to have a good yarn and I love stories and watch movies, but like uh, fundamentally, I think what I'm trying to do is like I'm trying to write about my engaging with my own life in the hopes that you know I used to do like these really you know I do these really boring comics where nothing happened, and part of my intention was like if somebody reads this and they're like. Why, why, is, why did somebody take the time, energy, you know, why did somebody go through the effort to make a six-page comic about a guy who heats up a bowl of soup, mm -hmm. you know? And, it par and what I, I'm hoping to do, I mean, partially it's because, like, heating up that bowl of soup is a really magical, wonderful experience. And I wanted to write about it in the hopes that somebody will really be like, I don't understand why that person would why you would want to make a comic about that 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 might trigger them to th like say well when i make a bowl of soup what happens yeah you know to appreciate the ordinary stuff more. yeah because like it's really i don't know i'm not going to say anymore <laughs> <laughs> what kind of soup is that is it uh well, the soup in the in the it was like a bean thread noodle bean soup. Thread. that yeah. sounds good
usually something you, you're reading about and you want to do a comic about it, and then when you start doing the comic about it, that means you got to do like a bunch more reading to make sure you got it all straight. That's basically it. Anybody else? Okay, well, we just got the zero minutes left sign, so I guess oh. that works. Thank you so much for being up here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.